Blinkist is the app that helps you become a more well-rounded person by letting you read or listen to an entire nonfiction book in just 15 minutes. You can try it for free and get 25% off a subscription by going to blinkist.com slash David Pakman. All right. I haven't done like a comprehensive where we are in the pandemic type update for some time, but it is time to do it. A lot of things have changed and, and there is much to discuss. So to begin with, we're starting to see some really significant improvements taking place. Vaccines are being rolled out more significantly. I know about the variants. I know about the so-called mutant strains and I will talk about them. I'm not ignoring them. I'm aware of them. I have the latest information as to how they will affect the vaccination program if this or if that. So I'm not ignoring that. Just give me five minutes to get to it. I know that it's what uh, a lot of folks have been focused in on, but let's dive right in. So first of all, cases, just the top line case number back in December. I predicted cases would peak permanently around January 10th to 15th. Now, how did I do this? Am I an epidemiologist? No. Am I a public health expert? No. Uh, was I special in predicting this? No. Do I want a, a pat on the back? Yes, but not for this. Um, a combination of uh, experts were pointing out that given the winter peak and vaccines being rolled out and the holiday effect, we were likely to see a peak sometime around the middle of January. And case in point case, that's a pun. Uh, the peak for the uh, seven day case average came on January 11th when the United States hit an average of two hundred and fifty five thousand cases per day. Since then, the number of cases has dropped by more than 40 percent to a seven day case average of one hundred and forty seven thousand cases. So the bad news is one hundred and forty seven thousand new cases a day is uh, insane. It's tragic. It's a disaster. Being down close to 50 percent in new cases per day in just a three week period that is absolutely fantastic. And I expect that by the end of the week, we will be down that full 50 percent. Now, uh, cases is one thing. But what about deaths? Uh, we also had reason to believe that the death peak would come three or four weeks after the case peak. Why did we have reason to believe that? Well, we know from the last year of this pandemic that deaths lag cases by three to four weeks. And indeed, the seven day rolling average of deaths plateaued over the last seven to 10 days and hopefully, hopefully will be on its way down soon. I had thought yesterday or today would be the peak. It turns out we've had sort of a plateau. Let's hope that those death numbers go down from here still. And I want to be clear that even as we see things improve, we don't want to forget that thousands of people have been dying in the United States every day. 4,000 down to 3,000 is still insane. It's still a 9 11 every single day, and there is a very long way to go. But the good news is that the numbers are doing what we thought they would in early December based on a lot of different factors, including vaccination. Let's now talk about that. Officially, the U.S. has seen about 27 million coronavirus cases. And the U.S. has now administered, not distributed, administered 33 million vaccine doses into the arms of folks. So we now have officially more doses than number of cases. That's a nice milestone. Now, if you remember my interview with Dr. Eric Topol a couple of weeks ago, our best guess right now is that the real number of cases, when you consider that many people never get tested because they're asymptomatic or they have mild symptoms and just never go and get a test, the real number of cases is believed to be somewhere between two and three times the official number. But still, it's a nice thing to be able to say we've now given doses, we've given significantly more doses than the number of total cases. As of right now, as of this morning, 8% of the U.S. population has received at least one dose. And about 2% of the U.S. population has received both doses. Remember, with the Pfizer vaccine, you have 21 days between dose one and two. With the Moderna vaccine, you have 28 days between dose one and two. You are not considered to be at maximum immunity potential. And remember, not everybody develops immunity, but close to 95% do. You're not considered to have completed the full course of vaccination and antibody generation. 
um, until seven to 14 days after your second dose. What we know is that these vaccines are working really well. Infections and hospitalizations are down among those first vaccinated. This includes healthcare workers and nursing home residents. The, the two vaccines in play are Pfizer and Moderna. And although the rollout was a little bit slower than we would have hoped, they are accelerating dramatically. Pfizer going to bring in additional manufacturers. A lot is happening there. We also have a third vaccine and more. But most imminently, we have the Johnson and Johnson vaccine imminently to be submitted for approval. And within a couple of weeks after that, hopefully emergency use authorization. That's a one shot vaccine. Now let's talk about the mutants, the variants. Uh, we have the UK variant, the Brazilian variant and the South African variant. The concern being vaccines are or might be less effective against those variants. Some people already going as far as to say they won't work. The vaccination program is in vain. We're vaccinating against a strain that is not even the strain. Oh, no. OK, let's stop. Let's sort of break it down a little bit into its component parts, because much of what we are being told so far is not true. First of all, the rate at which these uh, I don't want to call them primary. Yeah, I guess we could call them primary variants or or significant variants are mutating is exactly as expected for this type of virus. Nothing is happening that was not predictable in terms of these types of viruses and mutation. That's number one. Number two, uh, the as close as we can currently get to a reality based assessment of the effectiveness of vaccines on the variants is as follows. The two vaccines currently in use, Pfizer and Moderna in the United States, appear to be essentially as effective against the UK variant and the Brazilian variant as they are against the, the sort of uh, main strain, as we might know it. It is true that the antibodies generated by these vaccines appear to be less effective against the South African variant. That doesn't mean that they don't still generate enough antibodies to be immune to, for most people against the South African variant. And what I mean by that is as follows. When you vaccinate people, they generate antibodies on a curve. And, you know, we, we talk about it's 95 percent effective. What we mean by that is 5 percent of people who get the vaccine don't generate enough antibodies for immunity. Now, you might still generate enough to avoid a hospitalization or a death. But 5% don't generate enough antibodies for immunity to the primary strain. But you have a curve, so you might have just assign fake numbers to it. 95% of people generate at least a 100 level of antibodies. 90% generate at least 200 uh, level of antibodies. 80% are at the thousand level, so on and so forth. While it appears to be true that the antibodies generated are less effective against the South African variant, it may still be effective enough for most people to be immune. Imagine that the antibodies generated are a thousand level uh, and only a hundred of them are effective against the South African variant. Well, if the threshold to be immune is only 95, then you're still OK. And I hope I'm being clear about that. So. We still are gathering information about this. The idea that the vaccines don't work against the variants so far is not based in fact or science. It's not yet been demonstrated. And importantly, this is a race against the variants. The variants are a reason to vaccinate as quickly as possible, not to delay vaccination. Viruses mutate by spreading. The more people that vaccinate more quickly, we slow the spread of the variants and prevent more people from getting that variant, which may be a less controlled by the vaccines we currently have. Moderna and Pfizer both working on a, a sort of modified uh, booster in case it is necessary for some period down the road, could be eight or 12 months from now or maybe even longer. Now, as I said on the bonus show, I was on a wait list for leftover doses. A lot of, of, of hospitals and vaccination facilities are having issues where because there's multiple doses in a vial, you might get to the end of the day and have leftover doses. And most hop hospitals uh, have some kind of on call list. I have a friend who works at a hospital. I said, put me on the list. I will sh give me 30 minutes notice and I will show up 
uh, we don't, you know, she doesn't want any doses going to waste and neither do I. Um, I was able over the weekend to get uh, the first dose of the Moderna vaccine. I had more arm pain being a lefty. I got it in my right arm, more arm pain than for any vaccine I've had in my life. I had a fever and flu like symptoms for about 24, 30 hours. I spent Saturday in bed. I am now feeling fine and I'm ready and waiting for my second dose in a few weeks. Now, one last thing I want to talk about. There are more and more articles being written expressing concern that these vaccines are being undersold and they're being undersold when you hear cautious public health experts say things like even after vaccinated, you still should social distance and wear masks and avoid indoor crowds and all of this different stuff. And I think it's important to understand that until we reach a level approaching herd immunity, uh, we all still need to continue taking a number of the precautions that many of us have been taking. But we don't want to undersell the importance of the vaccine because then you're going to see a lot of people say what they are saying now, which is even if I get the vaccine, nothing changes. Well, then I'm just not going to get the vaccine. Uh, the truth is that these vaccines, particularly Pfizer and Moderna, are almost 100 percent effective at preventing death or even serious covid. That is a huge game changer. While it has not yet been confirmed that the, the uh, vaccinated individuals spread the disease to a significantly lesser degree, that's what would be expected. And that's usually how vaccines work. So I am a little worried about the degree to which the vaccines are undersold, as I said on the bonus show. And as I've uh, spoken about with you know public health officials and, and epidemiologists who are speaking not for the media, but just kind of between people um, in six weeks, in eight weeks, a group of four or six vaccinated people who work from home are able to be together with extremely low risk. It is not zero. Nothing is ever zero. But these vaccines are game changers and we want to make sure we are not underselling them and we continue vaccinating as quickly as possible. I get people are being cautious, but if you, we start telling people even with vaccination, you still have to social distance and wear masks indefinitely. A lot of people will say, well, I'm going to opt out and we don't want that. Uh, send me your thoughts. I am on Twitter at D Pacman. This is good news. Notice I didn't mention Trump or Biden in this entire segment. This is an analysis of the data and the science of what is going on. This is not a political statement, a political segment of any kind. Let me know your thoughts. I'm on Twitter at D Pacman. The David Pacman Show at DavidPacman.com. What if you could read 10 books in just one sitting? That's exactly what one of my favorite apps lets you do. It's called Blinkist. And what they do is take thousands of popular nonfiction books. They condense them down into text or audio that you can consume in 15 minutes. Blinkist makes sure that you're getting all of the important core insights from each book. So it's perfect for exploring a book you otherwise wouldn't have time for there's a full book you're thinking about buying, you can use Blinkist to get a sample first. Just think how much you can enrich yourself by being able to soak up an entire nonfiction book in just 15 minutes. I recently read A Brief History of Time, of course, by the great Stephen Hawking. This is a book that I have been aware of for so long and other things got in the way. And it was fantastic to check it out on Blinkist. Blinkist has books on politics, philosophy, science. They have 27 different nonfiction categories and a subscription is only about eight bucks a month and you get the entire library. But you can try it totally free and get 25 percent off a subscription when you go to Blinkist dot com slash David Pakman. I've put the link right underneath this video. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. The David Pakman Show is funded mostly by viewers and listeners like you through the membership program. Grab a membership at joinpacman.com. Coupon code available, never mandatory, better 21, all one word, better 21, saves you just a massive amount on a membership of your choice at joinpacman.com. So there's now a discussion happening about how soon. Joe Biden and Democrats should wait 
for Republicans to negotiate on the covid relief bill before just going forward and passing it without Republican support via budget reconciliation. If Democrats have the votes in the Senate now, there are people criticizing Joe Biden. Why is Joe Biden meeting with Republicans about the covid bill? Why is Joe Biden inviting 10 Democrat, uh, 10 Republican senators to meet as he did last night when these people are clearly bad faith actors? There's not going to be unity. There's not going to be negotiation that gets us anything close to what Joe Biden wants, which is a one point nine trillion dollar package. And I basically agree with all of that, other than to say the meeting is fine. Let's just understand that after the meeting, Republicans, as we've already seen them do this morning, are going to insist that they want some pathetic six hundred billion dollar stimulus bill. These same senators who now are going back to the tired old tropes of Republicans, we can't afford it. But where's the money going to come from? But inflation, but the debt, but the deficit. People who said nothing as Trump exploded the deficit, despite claiming he would pay off the entire national debt during his first term. These same Republican senators gleefully, happily voted for seven hundred and forty billion dollars for the military budget just recently. So they are hypocrites. They are exactly uh, who we believed them to be. They are going to obstruct and get in the way and blah, 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 blah. Joe Biden's proposal is for one point nine trillion dollars. These Republicans want six hundred and eighteen billion. And they met yesterday uh, with Joe Biden. So I think that the meeting with them is fine as long as Joe Biden and Democrats are ready to say, listen, remember, they promised two thousand dollar checks would go out right away. It's February now, right away. We could debate what right away means in government speak. But Joe Biden definitely made us think John Ossoff definitely made us think that the checks were going out quickly. It's been a couple weeks almost now. OK, so it's time to do it. Have the meeting with the Republicans, but understand that Republicans are going to make all sorts of demands. They are going to demand capitulation to their ideology, to their platform. They will weaken the bill. They will weaken the impact of the bill. And ultimately, even if you come up with something that's between 600 billion and 1.9 trillion, they'll probably still refuse to vote for it anyway. OK. Uh, these are not good faith actors. So don't be mad that Joe Biden is meeting with Republicans. I'm fine with it. It's fine that he's doing it. He claimed he wants bipartisanship and unity and all this stuff. That's fine. They were able to propose their six hundred billion dollar package and they are likely to vote against whatever compromise Democrats end up proposing. So my view is give them the meeting and then pass one point nine trillion without a single Republican, if that's what they want to do. Now, you need Joe. If you don't get a single Republican, you need Joe Manchin's vote. And we need to be sure that Joe Manchin is going to vote for it. Republicans will shriek. They will demand that they be met halfway. They will say, what about unity? What about bipartisanship? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, but when it's Democrats asking Republicans to meet them halfway, when Trump is in power, Remember what Republicans said. Well, elections have consequences. We're not going to just because you guys want this different thing. Trump won and we control this and we control that. So Democrats should have a spine and be ready because for an issue to have a compromise, both sides have to concede things to make that work. The Republican Party is not offering to concede anything. The Democratic proposal is one point nine trillion and it's popular with the American people. Republicans are just saying no is the concession that they will grant any money. Because remember, many Republican voters want the stimulus package as well. This is not a stimulus package that is only popular with Democratic voters. Republicans are not conceding anything. They are negotiating when they don't actually have leverage if Joe Biden and Democrats are actually ready and willing to pass this without a single Republican vote. So my suggestion is ignore the bad faith whining of Republicans. Democrats are passing popular bills that 60, 70, 80 percent of Americans support uh, the executive order uh, on masking from Joe Biden. And you can't you know, we talk about we don't want to stoop to their level. We don't want to do what they do. Listen, we're not obstructing anything. Joe Biden won. Democrats control the House. Democrats took the Senate uh, voters, including uh, independents, Democrats, but also Republicans want the stimulus. 
So just pass it. You gave them their meeting. It's time to pass it. You promised you would do it. And I hope that they actually do. This could be the first major success of the Biden administration, and it will show that it's Joe Biden who will set the agenda and Democrats, not Mitch McConnell, or this will be the first major failure for Joe Biden. And it will be a big failure when you say if I win and Ossoff and Warnock win, 2000 checks are going out right away and we get into February 10th, mid February, late February, and you still don't have anything passed or you end up passing something that's pathetic and paltry. Uh, that's not going to look good. So it's time to get it together. Let's uh, as we like to say, put on our big boy pants uh, and get this thing done. These people, these Republicans are not your friends. They're not going to help you. They're not looking to compromise. They're looking to get in your way. You've got to go around them on this important issue. Hey, this is super interesting. Uh, CNN did an analysis of the Trump rioters who have been arrested and found that many of these Trump rioters who were rioting because they believe the will of the people was not done and that somehow Joe Biden is going to be president, even though Donald Trump really won the election. A lot of those Trump rioters didn't even vote. Uh, this may not be surprised to many of you. CNN obtained voting records for more than 80 of the initial arrestees. Um, the majority did vote in the presidential election, um, but a bunch of them uh, are not even registered to vote. There are a whole bunch of people who either aren't registered or did not vote in the 2020 election. And this is interesting for for a number of different reasons. First of all, had they voted, they may not have felt the need to storm the Capitol because Donald Trump might actually have won It'll, if a lot of these riotous insurrectionists had voted. Now, I know it's only a few thousand people who went to D.C. I'm including in that people just generally supportive of the riotous insurrection. Uh, what is very clear and and unfortunate, uh, unfortunate uh, in terms of what it means about American culture and society is that conspiracy theories are far more compelling than simply going out and voting and participating in the democratic system that we claim to have. They didn't vote, but they're sure that Donald Trump must have won because hold on a second, even they couldn't be bothered to vote. And that is really something that should cause some self reflection. If you are saying I am sure Trump won because clearly more people must have voted for him. But wait a second. I didn't even vote. If I didn't vote, there's probably lots of people who prefer Trump who didn't vote. That moment of self-reflection seems to never come. And before you know it, they're in Washington, D.C., breaking windows and getting into the Capitol and messing with Nancy Pelosi's desk or whatever they were doing. Imagine the, the, the concept of stop the steal of our votes when we didn't even vote. Stop stealing our votes. I, I mean, other people like I didn't vote. OK, yeah, but I'm talking about other people. It's an incredible situation. And uh, many may even have stayed home because Donald Trump said it was rigged, which again raises the idea of whether Trump himself by saying it's rigged, don't vote early, don't vote by mail or do vote by mail, depending on the state, but not unsolicited ballots. All of that stuff may also have held down turnout in a way that was damaging to Donald Trump. Now, I have to be very real with you guys with how close it was it's probably a good thing that a lot of these people didn't vote. Trump really might have won if a lot of these people voted. It may have been Trump himself who suppressed turnout just enough to prevent him from even winning. And that's a really scary thought when you think about how close it was and how it came down to. Yeah, I, I know that we talk about a massive popular vote victory and the same electoral margin for Joe Biden than Trump won with in 2016. But it came down to, you know, 150, 60, 70, 100,000 votes in a few states, much like the 2016 election. Now, big picture, it is not uncommon that people who complain about government doing or not doing something don't even vote. That's not new. That's not surprising in the United States. Often half the country doesn't vote much more than half the country complains, but often half the country doesn't vote in this particular election. It was about 35, 40 percent of the country that didn't vote. It's an ideology of memes, conspiracy theories and sharing fake news on Facebook that often doesn't actually include voting. They are more loyal to violence and lies than they are to the just basic democratic systems that we have in the United States. And that's a really difficult thing to change when we talk about deprogramming. I'm going to have more to say about this maybe tomorrow or Thursday. 
when we talk about deprogramming, we have to understand that this culture runs really deep. Someone who is committed to sharing fake news but can't be bothered to vote. It goes beyond just convincing them that their ideas are wrong. It goes very, very much beyond that. Uh, let's take a quick break. Make sure you're following The David Pakman Show on Instagram at David Pakman Show. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. The number one funding source for the David Pakman show has been and continues to be membership and membership is not just a feel good thing. You get access to the world famous bonus show every single day just for members as well as commercial free audio and video feeds of the show day in and day out. You can sign up for membership very, very quickly at joinpacman.com. That's join P A K M A N dot com. If the normal prices strike you as high, by all means, use the coupon code better 21, all one word, all lowercase. Become a member today. Welcome back to the David Pakman show. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome to the program today, Jonathan Franklin, an investigative journalist who writes for The Guardian, is also author of the 2015 book, 438 Days, an extraordinary true story of survival at sea, which I recently read and recommended to the audience. Uh, Jonathan, it's, it's really great to have you on. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, I'm glad you like the fisherman boat you know, story. This is a guy who's on a boat all by himself for 14 months and somehow survived. So, you know, for all of us who've been through lockdown and confinement, there's a lot of interesting issues to help us get through. Yeah, but, well, maybe we'll start there. So for people who aren't familiar with the story of Jose Salvador Alvarenga, he is uh, originally a Salvadoran fisherman who, while working as a fisherman in Mexico in a storm, ends up drifting off to sea in a 25 foot boat originally with his uh, what would it be called like first mate or just sort of like an assistant, I guess we would say. Right. Yes. And ultimately, because of the storm, did not make it back and actually survived, as the title of the book suggests, 438 days. Now, at, at the time, was the previous longest known sort of precarious survival the 70 day incident? No, I think there was another one like 200 or something, but this of uh, 438 days and we're talking on a tiny boat. I mean, this is yeah. not much longer than an SUV. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it, it's an incredible story and obviously it exceeds the scope of our conversation to tell it all. But needless to say, it, it's an incredible story that is filled with both you know, everything from innovation in terms of how he survived to complete and total heartbreak and the reality of what happens uh, after being essentially alone for the large part of, of that 438 days. When you take a story like that and you want to tell the story and it's someone else's story to tell, how much are you interviewing? What's your approach? What do your notes look like and how do you end up turning it into the coherent narrative that it became? Well, it's really interesting you asked that, David, because this was a victim of, you know, intense trauma. He goes off fishing for the weekend, as you say. He loses his motor. He loses his buddy who actually dies along the trip. He's almost starved to death. He's in huge seas. He has to catch fish with his hand. He has to eat raw birds. And somehow he kept it together. And so when I first heard about this, I didn't believe it. I was like, he, cause he didn't he didn't look. He didn't look so skinny when he came off the boat. Some things didn't add up. But on the other hand, I figured if he had faked it, that was probably a pretty amazing story also. So either way, I had a story. And I flew to El Salvador and I tried to interview him and he couldn't talk. He was he was so in shock. He I was it was one word answers, almost like yes or no. I spent hours just trying to, you know, loosen him up. And he was in shock. Uh, he would sweat. He had nightmares. So it was over the course of five or six months where I ended up asking him about 2,500 questions, which turned into 500 pages of conversations. And those 500 pages of conversations, which uh, was an exclusive deal that I made with him, 
uh, is the basis for the book. Um, in, in the book, you describe many conversations and I'm interested in, in narrative nonfiction. There's a lot of different approaches to uh, dialogue and, and sometimes like just to pick somebody. Ben Mesrich will sometimes say that that he's using sort of creatively recreated dialogue that he feels tells the gist of what took place, but is not necessarily literally accurate or that stories may be combined or separated or wh whatever the case may be. What was your approach in sort of describing and telling the conversations that took place on the boat between Jose and, and his, his crewmate? Well, the interesting thing here is that the, the protagonist, Jose Salvador Alvarenga, about 33 years old, had never gone to school after about second or third grade. So he couldn't read. He couldn't write but he fully functioned in society. And one of the things I learned is that when you're illiterate, you also have the ability to develop an amazing memory because you got to keep a lot of things in your head if you can't read or write them down. That's interesting. So this guy had a fantastic memory and I could see it when I would interview him about a certain scene when he caught his first bird. And two months later, I would interview him again and he just nailed it. So he really had a fantastic memory and he, uh, you know, the, the dialogue is on, in the book is not that extensive. I only use dialogue that I was pretty sure I could, um, you know, get from his, you know, his side of the dialogue. And then he would tell me the other side of the dialogue. But the fascinating thing is he's often doing a monologue because he's out in the middle of the ocean. So the monologue, you know, he can tell me what his monologue was. So we have these amazing scenes where he's talking to a, a, a whale shark for days and days where he talks to a whale shark. He trains a bird to be his pet and his pet becomes, I mean, the bird becomes his pet and his companion. Even when his buddy dies, he's, he props up his buddy and he talks to the corpse for a week because he figures talking to a corpse is a lot better than being totally alone. Right. Um, you, you mentioned that it wasn't just you who was skeptical to some degree of the story initially. And when you consider that the, the we haven't mentioned this detail, but uh, he actually washed ashore with that same 25 foot boat uh, in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific in, in the middle of nowhere. And one of the elements that seems most compelling in, in the story is that, of course, there's no doubt that it's the same boat he left Mexico with. How how important is that detail in convincing you and others of the of the story? Well, that detail, like how did the boat get there? I mean, you know, you can't FedEx a boat. Uh, right. And the interesting thing is when the guy lands, the, he has no interest in talking to the press. He refuses to talk to the press. He calls the press cockroaches and he's trying to forget this trauma. If you're going to scam it, it's probably because you figure the publicity is going to get you something. So if you're going to scam it, it's unlikely your first move is to tell the press to blow off. Uh, there's that. But on a science level, I don't know anything about ocean currents, especially when I started this. So I went to the Scripps in Institution of Oceanography in the University of Hawaii and the US Coast Guard, and all three volunteered very generously to use uh, tracking software for ocean currents, drifting boats, and the University of Hawaii had just put a bunch of uh, GPS drifters in off the coast of Mexico's, you know, months earlier, and it lines up perfectly. In terms of if you're gonna throw something like a boat off the shore of Mexico, it's gonna end up in the Marshall Islands. So that part also checks out from all three of those, you know, the Coast Guard, Scripps, and uh, University of Hawaii. So this this is a fascinating story. I, I recommend it again to, to the audience. The book is 438 days now to talk about some of the other things you've done. I, yeah. I want to talk about um, the uh, Venezuelan uh, assassin sort of rehab camp in, in a moment. But before we do that, in the 90s, I believe it was when you were uh, reporting for Playboy magazine, you interviewed Timothy McVeigh. Is that that's right? That is right. I'm one of the few people who had an hour FaceTime face to face with Tim McVeigh in El Reno prison. So Timothy China. McVeigh, of course, uh, the perpetrator of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. What what are the circumstances of, of that interview? Well, the circumstances are is that I uh, I was always curious about McVeigh because, you know, a horrendous act. I mean, what causes you to put a bomb in a civilian building? And when I look back on it, I found that McVeigh had been in the Big Red One infantryman, uh, very, de very well decorated U.S. Uh, Army soldier. 
And when I started to look at what he did in the uh, first Gulf War in 1991, he was involved in a pretty horrendous massacre uh, where a bunch of M1 tanks had bulldozers put on the front of them. And instead of going trench, you know, mano a mano in the trench warfare, they just buried the Iraqis alive. About 2,000 were buried alive. And reporters at Newsweek won a Pulitzer Prize for the cover up of this story. Huge, you know, big deal. 2,000 people buried alive. You know, that breaks a few contexts of most codes of war. Yeah. Uh, McVeigh's job was to shoot off the survivors with machine guns. So you can kind of see that without justifying blowing up Oklahoma, which I'm not doing and I don't want people to take it that way, you have to understand that the first time this guy was involved in a huge, horrendous massacre, he got medals for it. He was applauded. You know, he, he, he had killed before. It's very interesting and very important, I think, to look at the first time he killed. So when I went to the prison, that's what I talked to him about, was uh, his war experience because – I had interviewed everybody in, in his tank before uh, I interviewed McVeigh. So when I go to interview him, my first question is, Tim, what was the name of your pet kangaroo rat when you were in the Gulf War? And he's like, how do you know I had a pet kangaroo rat? And I was like, Jose told me. He's like, how do you know Jose? Jose was the driver. Ah, I went out, I was out uh, snowboarding with Jose. Ah, you were hanging out with Jose? Yeah. And so all of a sudden, all those barriers broke down, and he's just giving me the inside story of what he did in Iraq and how, for him, Oklahoma City was an echo of uh, violence perpetuated by the U.S. government against uh, all these people who were buried alive in a trench. So there was, for me, I thought it was very important to figure out, you know, where does somebody go that kind of hyper violent? Yeah, one one of the commonalities that I've heard from folks who have interviewed those uh, who are known for or, or have committed just disgustingly uh, extreme acts of violence is that when they sit down with them in, in a room, there's two things that are common. One, how sort of unremarkable they are sometimes physically some. I mean, I think I think with that, totally true, totally yeah. true in this case. Yeah. I mean, I think like with Charles Manson, that's a big thing where he's just, you know, this little just kind of this small, uh, un, unremarkable guy. But also and this is a weird term to use how normal sometimes these folks can seem. And there's a lot of kind of connotations to that term. But but what was your sort of like general impression of the man? Exactly. I totally agree with you because people, you know, people want to see a monster and probably I wanted to see a monster. And I couldn't help think like this is the guy who like the neighbor who shovels your driveway in the snow. You know, he's a guy from, he's from Buffalo, New York. So he, he knows about shoveling snow. Right. Um, and uh, or it's the kind of guy you could talk at a bar. Um, he was. He was clearly intelligent, you know, sophisticated vocabulary, pretty damn good writer. Um, you know, you can call him misguided, insane, whatever. But the guy had done a fair amount of reading and, you know, he had he had his own political philosophy, whether you believe it or follow it isn't the point, really. But, you know, this was not some some jackass. This was a guy who, for his own his own twisted reasons or in his mind, his own logical reasons, uh, felt he had to attack the U.S. government. And so I really like I said, I. I was very interested in finding out about his first kill when um, when when I've talked to former uh, KKK types, white nationalists, et cetera. One of the things that's frequently mentioned is that the way they got pulled into their ex their extreme ideology in the first place came typically from a, a sort of opportunistic situation. Typically, they describe lacking a feeling of purpose or empathy given towards them as children or as teenagers at some point in their lives. And the people that brought this uh, extreme ideology to them brought the ideology really could have been anything, but it was the fact that someone was paying attention to them. There was something approximating, hey, exactly. somebody seems to care about me. No, or I call it tribal. You know, a tribe has adopted me. I, I, I saw this. I went to Las Vegas and spent a bunch of time with the young teenage Nazis of Las Vegas. And hmm. why were they Nazis? Not because they were anti-Semitic or because they knew much about Hitler. It's because their parents were working 24-7 and they're 17 year olds. And the people who scooped them up were a bunch of nutcase, you know, white supremacists. Right. <laughs> The ideology could have been anything that they were it sucked into. It could have been Muslim. It could have been Greenpeace. I mean, they, you know, they needed they needed a you know a tribe. They could have easily been protesting against tar sands and doing something, you know, in my views, positive for the world. They could have been, you know, they could have been building houses for the poor. They needed to be part of a tribe. They found a pretty terrible tribe, but you can't deny that most seventeen year olds need a tribe, and their parents are not usually included. <laughs> 
<laughs> so how does that compare thinking now of when you spent this time with the uh, for, former uh, hitmen in Venezuela? How how does it compare with how they were originally pulled into being hitmen? Exactly. I think I think these guys could have been hitmen or they could have been soccer stars. You know, what happened is I have some friends in Venezuela and they told me they were running a rehab camp for hitmen. And I was like, what? And so I flew out there and drove out there and went out to the backwaters of uh, uh, Venezuela. And sure enough, there was a hitman rehab camp and they said I could go camping with the newest group who were seven or nine different heads of different uh, gangs. And they were guys who hated each other, who would have likely killed each other, who had sent their assassins to kill each other, each other's troops. So they were stripped of their weapons and they were just given like flour and corn and matches. And, and they were stuck on the top of a hill surrounded by armed guards. And they had to just hang out for two or three days, cooking, eating and um you know, talking around the campfire. And but I so who who organizes that? I mean, in other words, how how does one get into a position to be one of the hitmen that's part of that? Is it is it under <laughs> duress that they're doing this or no? They get nope. They get they get recruited by a local businessman who had been a, a victim of armed robbery. And when he started to poke into the armed robbery suspects, he realized they were uh, hitmen and. He offered them uh, instead of turning them into the cops. He offered to let them uh, work on his on his his rum in his rum factory. He's a big rum factory. So he tried to get them rehab them on his own. And then they started. They showed up with the whole the whole gang. It's like you know you take in a stray dog, and then the whole pack comes in. He took in two of these guys, and the next Monday they were all piling, saying we want to be rehabbed. So he hired a psychologist. He hired some former cops. And then they go headhunting. They single out the most dangerous gang leaders in the hills outside of Caracas, and they and they convince them, which is not an easy process, to come uh, try and go straight. And I was there living with them for about maybe two or three days on this mountaintop with all these killers. And I just had a little video camera, and I was just videotaping them, getting them to confess their sins. And so, what what stands out to you about? those conversations and those interactions. Pretty remarkable that you can have a group of 21 year olds who like give zero value to human life. I, can, I don't know who to blame, but they just, mm. you know, they would kill a taxi driver because they didn't want to pay five bucks. You know, they, uh, they, one guy killed the classmate cause he made fun of him in seventh grade, you know, about his homework. And these guys were hardcore. Um, and they assumed they were going to die. If you, if you live to be 29, they called you grandfather. You become a grand, you know, that was like like a, a noble title. No, nobody was expected to make it to 30. So when you have that kind of hopelessness, apparently, and still kind of shocking, you know, killing somebody for money or for fun or for because you're in a bad mood is extremely common in a place like Venezuela, where if you give me a thousand dollars, I could probably get a rocket launcher. I mean, it's just there's a huge black market of guns in Venezuela. So, uh, you know, you had a lot of desperate, hopeless, violent men with access to heavy duty weaponry, you know, just recipe for problems. You know, one one of the things that some will assert is that to some degree, given the right economic circumstances and political circumstances that anybody placed into the situation you just described could end up as one of these 21 year old hitmen. How do you react to such a claim? I mean, could, could it could it really be anybody? No, I totally don't buy it. I don't I don't believe I don't believe that. You know, if you look at that famous study where people were supposedly torturing with electroshocks and that the study doesn't hold up. That if you look at that, that didn't happen. Most people refuse to to torture. You know, Lord of the Flies is fiction, you know. So I definitely strongly disagree that most of us have a potential hitman inside us. What was the uh, one I'm I'm speculating, but is there some risk to leaving that lifestyle in in Venezuela and the people were were the people that were at this camp were they taking a risk by saying I'm going to quit this yes and no they were taking a risk but staying in as hitman is even more risky i mean you got to you know being a hitman is like you know probably the, your your career is like like it's like the nfl it's like 3.7 years and then it's over uh, and so, and is yeah. part of that because there's a risk of getting caught and prosecuted or, or is most of the risk not from the legal system no the, these were a group of 30 men and you know they were down to like six of their six of them were still alive you know wow. all almost all of them, you know so this, you know the, the average age of these guys getting killed in uh, combat 
you know, street urban combat was about 18 or 19. And they were all, they, most of them, they were showing me their bullet holes. They all knew how to treat bullet wounds, which was pretty remarkable, you know, for 17 year olds to know how to treat bullet wounds. They used to piss on their bullets before they go to combat because they were sure, I don't think it's true, but that, that if there was urine on the bullet, that it would cause a deeper infection on the cops. Wow. You know, these guys, these guys were out there. Um, and in fact, a few days after my interview, the leader of the group was caught by another group and, uh, and chopped into pieces. You know, they, they, they mur more than murdered him. So this was a hyper violent, crazy world. And I was trying to just live with them and trying to get them to go on camera and tell me how it ended up this. And there are no easy answers. You know, I wish I could say, you know, keep your kids away from Fortnite and they won't be hitmen. But I don't think it's that simple. No, no, it seems uh, it seems not to be. Um, what are you what are you working on right now? Uh, right now, I'm doing a book on a uh, true story of a cruise ship that gets hit by COVID. Uh, it's a look at how the passengers and the crew come together. This is kind of the last cruise ship to go out before the world locks down. And uh, it, the crew, the, the, you know, the people start to die, they get sick. And so it's a story. It's kind of a it's a thriller, but it's also a beautiful story of how, you know, two, it's a, a community at sea, 2000 people had to find like a way to survive because they were just they were adrift for weeks. No country would take them. How many people, how many interviews do you do for a book like that? 150, 180. Wow. Wow. And is it even possible to keep the, the sort of intertwined nature of the 150 stories straight in your head? Or do you really need to rely on on notes and documentation? Yeah, no way I can do it in my head. No yeah. way. I got se I got seven dollars. Most of my brains otherwise occupied. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, I'm curious, you know, the the the, the narrative fiction, uh, a narrative nonfiction genre um, is is very interesting to me. And I've I've read, you know, diverse uh, narrative nonfiction, including your work. And I mentioned in my email to you, Ted Conover, who I interviewed, has done interesting work. John Krakauer, known for Into Thin Air and Into the Wild. What what are some of sort when you think of the genre, wh what books and authors do you think of? I think of Papillon, you know, the French prisoner, which may or may not yep. be a uh, narrative nonfiction because the publisher on his deathbed admitted there was a lot of uh, well went well beyond Ben Menrich's idea of creating dialogue that sounds good. Yes. So but but Papillon, fantastic, fantastic book there. Into Thin Air, still a classic. Um, you know, Perfect Perfect Storm. The book Perfect Storm is brilliant. I mean the the movie the movie's well done, but the book is brilliant. Uh, um, and um, I guess those, and I have to, I have to say, what's interesting about the one I did for th 438 days is that they did an audio version of it, and I've never really paid much attention to audiobooks, but this one has gone crazy, and I think for any of your listeners who who like audiobooks or need an inspiring story, it's about seven or eight hours, but the 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 reader George, who I don't know, but he did a great job. So we have a great, you know, really good reader and a thrilling tale. So if people know people who are depressed or even suicidal or, or, you know, just going stir crazy like most of us. Uh, the audio version of 438 days, half the time you can get it free on Amazon. Get it free if you can. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think it's a uh, it's a really it's a no, because the book's a tool. Obviously, I make money on books. But the whole point of this book uh, was to ho hopefully stop people from, you know, from suicide. Like the, the goal of the book was if one person reads this book and doesn't commit suicide, you know, that that was the goal that the fisherman and I set up from the beginning, because the fisherman said, look, I've been through mental stress, physical stress. You know, if I don't kill myself, if I can make it, you can. So I think there's a really there's a really strong, um, you know, resilience and survival here that goes, you know, it touches a lot of people. And unfortunately, a lot of people need that message right now. Well, 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 well said. Uh, we've been speaking with Jonathan Franklin, investigative journalist, writes for The Guardian, author of 438 Days. Uh, Jonathan, I so appreciate your time today. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate, you know, your questions and a beautiful interview. Well done. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show is audience supported media, and you can contribute any amount you want on Patreon as little as one dollar per month. Plus, you can get the daily bonus show world famous at this point and the daily commercial free TV show 
by making those pledges at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. This is audience supported media. We depend on the support of our viewers and listeners, whether you listen to the podcast, watch on YouTube or watch us on TV or even listen on the radio. Patreon.com slash David Pakman show. The David Pakman show at David Pakman.com. This is super funny. I told you guys on yesterday's show that Donald Trump's impeachment lawyers just quit on him. And Donald Trump yesterday was able to get new impeachment lawyers, at least one, a guy named David Schoen. And he went on Fox News last night with Sean Hannity and he just imploded, showing us instantly what this impeachment trial is going to be like. Here is Donald Trump's new impeachment lawyer. Again, a bunch of his lawyers quit. He got a new guy telling Sean Hannity that he might call Democratic senators or as he calls them Democrat senators as witnesses over what he calls bias. What? Yeah, I don't know either. Let's take a look March to the Capitol so your voices can get heard. And they I think you're right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there are two points about this. I would say you also should be able to call then uh, many of the senators as witnesses because of the awful bias and prejudgment they've shown. Can you imagine any American citizen considering it to be a trial in which the judge and jury has already announced publicly that the uh, defendant must be convicted in this case. And in fact, um, Senator Leahy called demanded that Senator McConnell vote for conviction also. Um, you know, both sides, everyone, it's clear to them, Donald Trump undercut, undercut democracy. How can we possibly have a fair trial? Chuck Schumer, uh, Senator Schumer promised a, a fair and full trial. You can't when you know that the juror and the judge um, are biased going in. Notice at the start that Sean Hannity is actually defending Trump's role in inciting the insurrection, saying, listen, he was telling people to go to the Capitol to have their voices heard. And it's funny to say Democratic senators are doing something wrong by calling for conviction before the trial. Remember Trump's first impeachment when Republican senators prejudged an acquittal of Donald Trump? Where was this guy then? Where was Sean Hannity then saying, you know, the trial hasn't happened yet, so they really shouldn't be prejudging it. They're not going to be calling any Democratic senators as, as witnesses anyway, by the way. Then Trump's impeachment lawyer says he doesn't want any videos of the insurrection shown at the trial. He says this has nothing to do with Donald Trump. And the second thing is, does this country really need to see videotapes? We know now, apparently, that Mr. Swalwell and the other managers tend to show videotapes of the riots and people calling in, people being hurt, police officers talking. Why does the country need that now? We would stipulate that there was a riot that went on that day. It was a tragedy. President Trump has condemned violence at all times. Read the words of his speech, calls for peacefulness. Um, th this has nothing to do with President Trump and the country doesn't need to just watch videos of riots and unrest. We need to heal now. We need to move forward. Is that the speech Trump gave when the riot was already over that David Schoen is referring to? Or then the one that he gave days later where he retroactively condemned the violence that he was gleefully loving based on reports from the actual day of January 6th? It's funny how David Schoen keeps saying the country doesn't need to see videos of the Trump riot. The trial is for senators. Now, I understand it's nationally televised. I know the country will see whatever evidence is put forward, but the trial is for the senators to adjudicate. What justification is there for not including relevant video evidence during the trial for the people who are going to be adjudicating guilt or innocence or guilt or, or lack of guilt to make it easier for them to acquit? Maybe. He doesn't want the videos put up there. Oh, I don't know that 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 footage was never presented. And you'll remember that Kelly Leffler hilariously said at one point during her senatorial campaign when asked about the Trump uh, grab him by the you know what tape. Oh, I don't what what tape is that? I don't know. The reason you put the footage in front of the, in front of the senators during the trial is so nobody can say, listen, I don't know, based on what I saw during the trial, which is all we're supposed to consider, I didn't see any reason to convict Donald Trump. Now, the Republicans aren't going to convict them anyway, but at least expose them for the shills that they are by putting all of the evidence in front of them, including video of the riot. Now, one last clip. 
Here's a possible preview of the defense strategy, which is to call the entire thing unconstitutional. And you've hit the, many of the main arguments that I think are attractive to the American people. They're all right on. But I'm going to say to you that besides the fact that this process is completely unconstitutional and that this is a very, very dangerous uh, road to take with respect to the First Amendment, putting at risk any uh, passionate political speaker, uh, which is um, really an, uh, against everything we believe in in this country, foundation of the First Amendment. But I'm going to tell you, I think it's also the most ill-advised legislative action that I've seen in my lifetime. It is tearing the country apart at a time when we don't need anything like that. I think President Biden missed a great opportunity to be a statesman and to have demanded that this thing be called off, frankly. Um, this is the political weaponization of the impeachment process. There was a rush to judgment. Uh, listen, when President Trump became president, the day he was elected, there were calls for his impeachment ready. This is the weapon they've tried to use against him. Um, but now we know also that the agenda, um, Ms. Pelosi and others, is simply to bar President Trump from ever running for president again. And that's about as undemocratic as you can get. Can you imagine the slap in the face that is to the 75 million or more voters who voted for Donald Trump? So this is not a First Amendment issue. Donald Trump as president had the biggest bully pulpit in the world. He used it and that bully pulpit caused a riot. Now, there are possible consequences for that speech. There won't be because Trump will be acquitted. But these are the possible consequences to your speech. David Schoen calling for Joe Biden to demand the trial be called off, by the way, is ridiculous. As I've said for weeks and months now, Joe Biden should have no involvement whatsoever in the impeachment trial. Trump was impeached by the House before Joe Biden was even president. Biden should do nothing one way or the other, period. And then David Schoen even sort of placates. I don't know if you noticed this. He placates the stop the steal conspiracists. He says the 75 million or more voters who voted for Trump. That's a dog whistle. That's the suggestion that, OK, 75 million people officially voted for Trump, but there may even be more uncounted votes out there that we still need to respect as well. This guy is absolutely pathetic. Here's, he's merely a political hatchet man, a political tool. He should be ashamed of, of himself. And the trial starts one week from today, and we will be covering much of it. We have a voicemail number. That number is 2192 David P. Here are some really basic questions about QAnon that I myself have been asking. Hey, David. I have a question regarding QAnon. I still don't fully understand. I mean, from what we know, it's Me neither. A one person account or multiple people from one account. How is it that this person hasn't, say, been exposed yet? He says he's a government insider. Yeah. You believe that the FBI is actually investigating who this person is, how this, say, started, you know, and where the responsibility lies as far as holding this person accountable for. I have no idea. These are the questions I've been at. I, I, I get the idea that some people think Q might be Trump. Some people believe Q is a group of people. Others believe Q is an individual. How does Q communicate? I guess originally it was via 4chan, but more recently it's something else. It's as incoherent to me as it is to you and to many of the people in our audience. And I don't know if we'll ever get the answers to the questions that are being asked, but they are good questions. We have a great bonus show for you today. Anti-vaxxers briefly were able to shut down Dodger Stadium's vaccination site over the weekend. Uh, it's actually insane what's going on uh, with the anti-vax movement in the United States. The number of hate groups declined in 2020, but the number of hate incidents went up. That's an interesting uh, series of facts that we're going to discuss. And we will also talk about this uh, situation between Vice President Kamala Harris and Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, who is the most conservative Democratic senator in the U.S. Senate. What's going on with the two of them? We will discuss that and much, much more on today's bonus show. Get instant access, instant, truly the speed of light access to the bonus show by becoming a member at joinpacman.com. You can use the coupon code better 21 to get yourself a massive discount off of the cost of the membership of your choice. I'll see you then.
Thanks a lot for watching today's show. I just want to take a second to tell you about today's sponsors. Blinkist is the app that helps you become a more well-rounded person by letting you read or listen to an entire nonfiction book in just 15 minutes. You can try it for free and get 25% off a subscription by going to Blinkist.com slash David Pakman.